Well, you know, and this is what's on my heart. I, I, I woke up this morning. I've got an app. Uh, it's called the Dwell app. And every morning yeah. when I wake up, the Dwell app alerts me that it's got scripture for me to listen to. And it's read by, I think it's read by computers that try to sound like humans. But regardless, it wakes yeah. me up every morning with some scripture. And this morning it was Psalms 46. And just as I laid there before I got out of the bed, I let that app play me that scripture. It's got music behind it. But God is our refuge and strength of ever present help in a time of trouble. And I laid there listening to Psalms 46 this morning. He talks about the, the weapons being broken and God showing up in that moment. But as I thought about him being an ever present help in a time of trouble, yeah. I, I thought about how interesting it is that when we're in a time of trouble, we are very quick to say, where's God? Well, the writer in Psalms says he's ever present or very yeah. present. Some translations say, uh, I like to say it this way. He's all up in the middle of it when I'm in trouble, even if Hallelujah. I can't feel it. If my emotions are a wreck, I can trust the word that he is all up in the Hallelujah. middle of that, that he is yes. ever present. That You, with what you're dealing with right now in your health, you, health, you don't feel good. The world, I mean, if everything wasn't messed up enough for you right now, now you got COVID to deal with and you can't taste the chips and salsa at the, at the Mexican restaurant. How bad is life when you can't enjoy the chips and something? Now, for me, it's cheese dip, but how bad is life? But the word promises us, the Bible promises us that he is ever present, that he is. Absolutely. I like to see that this way, that he is more so present when I'm in a mess than when things are going good. Absolutely. The Bible tells us that he's attentive to our cries, that his eyes are always roaming, looking for us over and over. It talks about how he he's seeking us out. If you read Song of Solomon, he's coming after us. He's Absolutely. playing music to get our attention. He's always there. I think it's got to do with whether or not we turn to him. We tune our ear. And so as I was trying to tune my ear last night and this morning, just for and what we important. can talk about today. Tuning your, tuning your ear tuning is important. Your ear. Yeah. My Lord, that's the truth. Yes. And, and when we're in a mess, we don't want to tune our ear. When things aren't like we want them to be, we don't want to tune our ear. We want to, we think our thoughts, which a lot, of, you know, the Bible says his thoughts are way above ours. You know, we That's think our thoughts, thoughts and we dwell on our thoughts. Yeah. Um, but I was thinking about Elisha. You know, I said it last time I was on the program. I hate to bring it back up. Um, but one of my mantras has been for a, a couple years now that, that our next is always better than our now. Yes. That, that what God has for us, and I know we live in the now and we need to, you know, I, I preach and teach that um, we move from glory to glory, ever increasing glory. Every and I like to tell my church, that means that where you're at now needs to be glory before you move to the next level. That if, you, if you're renting a house and you want to buy a house, that you need to clean up the rental house, that you need to make your rental house glorious. Yes. If you expect God to allow you to purchase a home. Um, but I always talk about wow. that net. That don't mean that we don't need to take care of our now, that now's not good, but our next is always better. And as I was thinking about that last night, I was thinking about the power exchange from Elijah to Elisha. And I, I just kind of want to, I know when I mention something to you and start talking about it, your wheels will start turning. But that <laughs> yeah, already. power shift, because we yeah. moved from Elijah to Elisha. And as I read it last night and studied a little bit, yeah. uh, I, I don't mean to, you know, I'm not a political guy. I know, I know you love politics. I got it all turned off. I don't want to hear none of it. I'm, I, listen, I, I don't want to hear any of it. <laughs> but listen, looking at Elijah and Elisha, they, were, they had a man uh, serving as king that handed his signet ring to his wife and let her sign documents for him. Oh, and if that's not a picture of where we're at right now, uh, handing off the powers that be, a, a man in place. It, it, I laugh when I see that Ahab, Naboth wouldn't give him his vineyard. And he goes and lays on his bed and cries like a little girl. Yeah. And, and his wife comes in and says, why are you crying and sulking? Get up, you know, I'll deal with that for you. And then she deals with it wrong in order to get him the vineyard. And True. in that, we have Elijah and Elisha. And we well, move from so a portion of anointing into a double portion of anointing, up under a tyrannical rule, up under, yeah. up under a mess in government. We move from Hallelujah. an Elijah anointing to an Elisha anointing. A so in, in anointing. my spirit, what I'm going to be talking to my church about 
is that we're in a moment right now that we can focus on what Ahab's doing. Can we just call yeah. him Ahab and Jezebel without offend anybody That's today? Right. We can focus on what Ahab's doing and we can talk about what Jezebel's doing. But what yeah. we need to focus on is the fact that when we feel like we are the last one, yeah, still yeah. getting it right, that God says, I've, I've got men hit. Cool. I've, wow. I've got pastors hit out all over this nation that yeah. are ready to step into the next phase of this thing. I've got churches oh, yeah. that hadn't even been heard of yet that are ready to step into the next phase. I've got, yes. I've got ministers that have been in a single portion anointing that are getting ready to step into a double, double portion, portion anointing. Oh, and I don't yeah. consider myself a prophet but the prayer in my That's heart prophetic. right now, right now is that, that we would see that next level of a new. Yes. When, when Elisha was looking at, he was doing the most mundane thing, plowing a field. And this stranger walks past him and he takes his mantle mm. and he hits him and then does the most ridiculous thing. He keeps on walking. Now you would <laughs> think if you're looking for your, for your next, the air of your anointing, You'd have sat down and explained to the guy and said, look, this is what's happened and this is what happened. And, and God showed me that you were the... No, no, no. And what happened was Elisha left the ox in the field and ran after Elijah and says, hey, what? And, and, and Elijah turned around and says, what have I got to do with you? Go back to your plow. Go back to what you're doing. Yep, yep, yep. And Elisha followed the anointing. Mm, come on. Most people get a touch from God, and they go right back to plowing. The difference between the giants and the kings and those that will always be plowmen is the kings stop everything, and Elijah says, I'll show you what I'll do with the oxen and the plow. And he went back and built an altar, slaughtered his father's oxen, which were like destroying the, 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 the messy Ferguson tractor and destroyed the whole thing. And he says, I'm coming with you wherever you go. And what God's looking for in the day we're living in is not plowmen, not guys who go back to just running the field back and forth and trying to keep the lines as straight as possible. But whenever you're touched by the anointing, whenever the mantle hits you, you don't say, whoo, that was good, I like that, wow, hallelujah, what a great service we had, God. No, 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 no. God's looking for people that will say, I don't care what it costs me, I'm going to kill the ox, I'm going to burn the plow, I'm going to do whatever it takes. But when that guy leaves, and that's the anointing. I am going with him in the name of Jesus. And that is where the church will rise and fall in the day we're living in. You know what he did? Wow. Exactly what you said. He laid down his earthly legacy. Yes, sir. That was his earthly legacy his dad was leaving for him. And Give he said, I'm, yeah. if I stick with this legacy, then I'm going to miss a heavenly legacy. Oh my so I'm going to end this legacy so that I can follow Elijah and receive a heavenly legacy. Legacy. So in the first moment, uh, Elijah brings the cloak to him. But then at the end of Elijah's life, when he asked, well, what can I do for you? Well, I want a double portion of your anointing. He yeah. said, if you see me when I go, in other words, if you'll stick this thing out, if you won't give up, yes. if you won't. And he follow, and he I keeps turning that. and saying, quit following me. What are you doing? And he says, I'm not going to. So when Elijah finally goes up in the chariot, Elisha, then the mantle's not laid on him. He has to pick the mantle up Absolutely. and roll and what, it up. And that's when And what's mind-blowing is the sons of the prophets, the sons of the prophets knew that Elisha was, mm -hmm. Elijah was being taken away. They told Elisha. Yep. And yet yep. it, the Bible says that only two of them walked forward. All of the religious yep. stuff, all of the guys that knew, oh, this is going to happen mm -hmm. next, and this is what this is, we, we know the word. And we, let me tell you something, that doesn't qualify for the anointing. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the ability mm -hmm. to climb up after you've been knocked, <laughs> knocked down and your heart broken yeah. and everything around you is yeah. falling to pieces. Yeah. Listen to me, Pastor. It's not your last mistake that God will judge you on. Amen. It's your first next uprising that God will judge you on. It's when you stand up and say, mm -hmm. boy, that hurt me to death but I'm still following the anointing. And that is where yes. the double portion comes from. Yes. You oh, know, I'm glad there, I called you today. A demarcation. <laughs> there's a demarcation right now. Uh, Sunday before last, I was yeah. ending my message and I, I told my church, I said, look, you've got to understand that we're at an Ebenezer moment. We are standing the rock up. We are pouring oil on it. We, we're saying, God, you have been good to us thus far. But and, and I, I'm standing in front of our congregation and I don't know how to 
help them understand next Sunday can't be the same. So I I gave my podium away. I said, y'all been watching me preach behind this podium for years. I said, I want it out of this building. Next Sunday morning, you will not see this podium on this stage. I want it gone because you have to come in next week and understand there is a demarcation here that we are stepping into a new anointing, that we are stepping into a new day. And that's what happened there. And Elisha knew it, but the people around him didn't. Remember what they said when they needed a prophet after Elijah was gone? They said, well, here's a guy that used to pour water on the hand. He served Elijah. That's the closest thing we've got. Maybe he can do something. And and I think what you're saying there, the following, the burning the plows, the walking away from that, We've got to be willing to go yes, after. Sir. If there is a moment, if there is a, if if something touches you, yeah, uh, you may not have another chance to make that contact. Just like Bishop Miller on with you a few weeks ago, uh, how many people was touched by that? Yeah, that could have. I mean, I, I sent a message and just said, "Hey, really enjoyed that because I'm yeah. I'm going to honor that moment." Um, because we don't know when our last chance is to receive from that person. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's utterly important that we don't just, like you said, take a blessing and say, well, man, that was a great church. No, there's a line drawn in the sand today. There are churches it wasn't just in America, a great service. There are churches in America and around the world who, who mark their existence by what happened either at a good thing or a bad thing. I was down in your neck of the woods one time. I was putting gas in my car, and this pastor came up to me and recognized me from PTL, I believe, and he says, man, he says, I, I just, I'm so pleased to meet you. And, and I said, hey, how are you doing? It's good to talk to you. And you pastor a church? Yes, I pastor a church. Wonderful where we're where at. And he told me the name of the, the town where he was in, and we talked a little bit more. And, um, and then his face kind of clouded over, and he says, you know, he says, uh, 12 years ago, we had a split. 